Hope you have time and a snack, as this story is quite extensive, covering events from late 2019 to last week. Following the rules, all names are altered. Here's the backstory. My soon-to-be ex-wife was my high school sweetheart. We began dating in 1992 at the age of 17, and at 45, we're still together. She's the only woman I've ever been with, and we got married at 22, right after college. A year later, our first of two children, both boys, 22 and 17, came into our lives. I dedicated 23 years to her, building a house and working tirelessly to provide the life she wanted. Despite inevitable rough patches in any marriage, we always found a way to overcome challenges, making the discovery of her affair even more shocking. Let's go back to March 2020, when I first sensed something was off. For the preceding two months, we were in a funk. I was recovering from reconstructive knee surgery, I blew out my ACL in fall 2019, still limited in movement with only about 55% range of motion. This took a toll on various aspects of our life. On workers' comp due to a job-related injury, I couldn't handle my usual household duties, resulting in a backlog. While my sons helped where they could, tasks only I could manage had to be postponed, or my wife had to step in, which displeased her. Things also came to a standstill in the bedroom between us. It had already slowed down before my injury, but in my then state, it completely stopped. During these months, she, let's call her Sue, spent more time hanging with co-workers after work. From November 2019 to March 2020, it was a regular occurrence. Naturally, I thought nothing of it, given the 23 trust-filled years we'd shared. Sue and I had our own friends, and we also had mutual ones, I used to hang out with my friends frequently without any issues. Everything was above board. Around January of this year, however, I noticed something odd. Sue started becoming noticeably distant. While we were in a funk, she had never denied me affection to that extent. The usual hugs and kisses came to a halt. Her phone, which was always in her hand, became a source of suspicion, as she was now guarded about it. Even her interactions with me became more snippy, as if she couldn't be bothered. Fast forward to March, COVID has arrived, and New York City is in lockdown. Our chosen careers are deemed essential, so we don't have to work from home. Having recently been cleared to return to work after five months, I was eager to get back into action. Five months on my back, rehabbing my knee and being unable to engage in physical activities had driven me nuts. For context, I enjoy physical activities. I'm an avid martial artist, typically hitting the gym four days a week in addition to all the home projects I tackled. Within a week or two of the lockdown, my STBXW informs me that she'll have to start putting in extra hours. Once again, I think nothing of it due to her field. I assumed it would be every other day, but no, it was every day, and not just for an hour or two. She would come home three or more hours later, go straight to the shower, spend a little time with me, a little time with our 17-year-old, the 22-year-old lives with his GF crosstown, and then go to bed. As I become more adept at supporting myself on my knee, our copulation resumes. However, as you would probably guess, she wasn't mentally or emotionally present for it, a fact I noticed quickly. By early April, the situation became clearer to me. All signs pointed to the idea that she was having an affair. That's when I decided I needed to find answers. I scoured the internet for signs of infidelity, and she was pretty much ticking all the boxes on such behavior. My search then advanced to how I could find proof. I started with her social media, looking at her Facebook entries from months prior, which were pretty much the usual. They included pictures of us and our sons, pictures with her friends, and quite a few of her nights out with co-workers. In these pictures, there's a mixed bag of her closest friends from work, along with a couple of people I've never met from her workplace but one recurring thing caught my eye in many of these pictures. One guy. In every photo he's in, he's uncomfortably close to her, with his arm around her shoulder or his hand on her lower back. Way too close for a guy I've never personally met. Needless to say, that put a sour taste in my mouth. But that wasn't the worst of it. No, no, no. The worst part was the fact that, apparently, this guy is a friend of hers on Facebook and follows her on Instagram. So I go to look up his Facebook account and wouldn't you know it, I'm blocked. Why the heck am I blocked from seeing this guy's Facebook account, but he's friends with her, on Facebook? Yep, now I'm in Batman detective mode. At that point, 
I wasn't even trying to deny it. I knew she was cheating on me with this guy. My mission was to find out for how long. And over the course of April and May, that's what I did. You know, I never had any clue about the depth of info you could secure from phone, text, and email records until then. We have a family plan cell phone package, and I was able to pull up quite a bit of data. My soon-to-be ex-wife's data history was telling. The two most frequent numbers she had interacted with from October 2019 to April 2020 were my own and a number I'd never seen before. Take a wild guess whose number it was? A quick check on Google confirmed it was the guy from the photos who blocked me on Facebook. We'll call him POS because that's what he is. Again, the picture becomes even clearer at this point. But a lot of their messages and texts were disjointed, indicating she was deleting a lot of them. I knew she was cheating on me with this guy, but nothing in the data could serve as a hot lead. I needed more evidence. It's at this point that I tell my best friend Oz what I had found. He asked me if I confronted her with what I had, and I said no because I felt like it wasn't enough. That's when he told me about an app that I could download to apparently spy on her communications in real time. I won't say the name as I don't know the rules on that here. I got it installed, synced up my data plan, and waited. Within days of doing so, I finally saw it. A text string between the two of them, talking about how much fun they'd had the previous night and making plans to do it again that weekend. Boom. Gut punch. To say it was completely devastating was an understatement. I guess that moment counts as my D-Day, and for the next two days after, I was just broken. I actively distanced myself from her during those two days immediately after D-Day, which she noticed. She'd try to console me and ask me what was wrong, but I'd brush it off and leave her presence. I couldn't even look at her. This woman who I gave 23 years of my life to, who I have given everything to as a husband and more, stepped outside of our marriage for a guy just five years older than our eldest son. By the third day, I wasn't even sad anymore. I was furious. I informed Oz that my suspicion had been confirmed, and he inquired if I had confronted her. I replied in the negative, expressing my desire for payback beyond mere divorce. I aimed to thoroughly disrupt and ruin her life. Formulating a plan, I drew inspiration from a quote in my readings on infidelity, emphasizing unpredictability as the enemy. This principle became the foundation of my strategy, making her life challenging while secretly planning my exit. As we entered early June, the app remained installed, and each night, I meticulously gathered data from their messages. Their exchanges portrayed a full-fledged relationship, including romantic texting, romantic expressions, and explicit content. Having stopped actively reviewing the content, I focused on collecting information and cataloging it on my private FPS server. Simultaneously, I began engaging in unconventional behavior, going out at odd times and returning home later than she did. In her presence, I increased my phone usage, responding to her inquiries about my activities with a nonchalant, just stuff, before putting my phone away. I changed my login information, denying her access. Throughout our marriage, transparency was the norm but around the presumed start of her affair, she altered her passwords on Facebook and her phone, citing recent security breaches as a cover for concealing the affair. Having briefed Oz on my plan and shared the situation with my older sister and two close friends, I entrusted them with secrecy. For context, Oz and I have been friends since childhood, and the other friends, Joey and Nina, we've known since high school. Nina becomes relevant later. Come July, my STBXW is in full paranoia mode, intensifying her texts and calls, questioning my whereabouts, and expressing concerns about my actions. The seed planted in her head the previous month is beginning to sprout, especially evident in her communication with POS. She confides in him about her doubts and confusion, accusing me of growing cold and distant. The audacity of this woman. Amidst these interactions with POS, she suggests they should avoid meeting at our house confirming his presence in my home. Thanks, Sue. In a specific communication, POS asks if she's worried about me potentially cheating on her, infuriating her. Reading this exchange brings me immense joy and laughter. A cheating wife arguing with her affair partner about the possibility of her husband cheating on her. The irony is palpable. To clarify, I'm not involved with anyone else. When I leave, I usually spend time at Oz or Joey's, enjoying drinks, watching fights, and bonding with my friends. Alternatively, I might be at my big sis's house, 
hanging out with her and my BIL, who's like an older brother to me. My sis is 52 and her hubby is 58. She informed him about my STBXW's infidelity, but not about my plan, as he tends to be a bit of a blabbermouth. Fast forward to October, and things intensify. In my faux affair for three months, Sue is keenly aware of my active withdrawal. From the inception of my plan until October 20th, 2020, the day she confronted me, there was no physical contact between us. No hugs, kisses, or initiation of copulation. Nothing. Not that she needed it. She continued her involvement with POS, either at his place or motels. That afternoon, she calls me at work, an uncommon occurrence before all this began, and asks me to come straight home after work, claiming she has something important to tell me. I won't deceive you all. I was halfway expecting her to confess to her infidelity, but of course, she didn't. Instead, I arrive home to find her questioning whether I'm unhappy with her. The nerve! She points out that I've been spending too much time away, lacking affection, and our bed life has withered. She suggests I might be pushing her away due to resentment over her treatment during my knee rehab months. Then, the punchline. She asks if I'm cheating on her. Folks, I collapsed on the floor, laughing uncontrollably, like Joker laughing gas hysterical. While it may have seemed like I was dismissively laughing off the idea of infidelity to her, I was actually laughing at the sheer irony unfolding before me. In fits of laughter for a good two minutes, I compose myself enough to respond. I sit up, meet her eyes for the first time in months, shake my head without giving an answer, stand up, brush myself off, kiss the top of her head, and proceed to settle in for the night. Later that night, in my office, I decide to check what she's been telling him, given the brevity of the incident. I fire up the app, and they're indeed texting in real time. She informs POS that she believes he is cheating on her. She mentioned confronting him tonight, describing his reaction as laughter. She feels he doesn't care about her feelings anymore and is convinced that he's gone. She sees it as karma and acknowledges that she has lost him. The smile on my face reading that must have resembled the Cheshire cat. She was breaking. POS tried to console her, stating that if I cared enough, she wouldn't have had to seek comfort from him. However, the tone of her responses indicated doubt. She had the audacity to step out of our marriage during my legitimate injury, keeping the affair going for nearly a year. Yet, the thought of losing me to another woman made her waver? What a weakling. Simultaneously, I executed the second part of my revenge plan, organizing my financial affairs. In September, I consulted with a family attorney to initiate divorce proceedings, armed with the substantial evidence I had gathered. New York being an at-fault state for divorce, the overwhelming proof of Sue's infidelity pretty much ensured I could nail her in a divorce case. My attorney advised me to organize all my financial documents in anticipation of potential asset division. Going a step further, I covertly withdrew all my funds from our joint account and transferred them to my personal account. Additionally, I initiated the search for an apartment as part of phase two. Fast forward to November and my behavior remains consistent. In fact, I've escalated it. This is where my friend Nina becomes significant. For context, Nina and Sue have never been what one would call close. I met Nina two years before Sue during my freshman year of high school. From the beginning, Sue viewed Nina as a threat since she's my closest female friend. Although Sue has never explicitly addressed it, her mistrust of Nina is evident to anyone paying attention. Conversely, Nina has never been a fan of Sue. Early in my relationship with Sue, Nina pointed out how Sue was intruding into our friend circle, while I didn't do the same with Sue's set of friends. This bothered Nina because she understood why Sue was doing it. Jealousy. Even now, among Sue's circle, there are no male friends except POS, while Nina is the only female in my friend group. Nina, who had been overseas due to the virus, returned to NYC on November 3rd. To celebrate her return, Oz, Joey, and I planned a small gathering at Joey's house, with dinner and drinks, sticking to CDC guidelines. Nina, the mastermind, proposed an idea to trigger Sue by taking photos similar to those I discovered of Sue and POS months earlier and posting them on my Facebook. And that's exactly what we did. Sue got wind of it on the 5th. As some friends noticed my updates and observed how uncomfortably close I appeared with Nina. This thoroughly confused her because she still believed I was cheating. 
Although she likely wanted to accuse Nina, she knew Nina had been stuck in Europe for most of the year. Nevertheless, that didn't stop her from attempting to criticize me that night for being handsy in the photos. I saw this as a perfect opportunity to deliver the lead jab for my knockout blow. I mentioned the pictures with her and POS from last year, noting that he was pretty handsy in them. I pointed out that I didn't get bent out of shape over it. Deer in headlights. It was the first time I had even mentioned the guy's name throughout all of this. The gears in her head started spinning in real time as she tried to explain away those pictures. Up to that point, she hadn't known I had seen them, given how infrequently I use Facebook. When I do post something, it becomes an event, which is why the pictures with Nina specifically gained so much attention among our circles. And explain away she did, stating that he's that way with everyone, he's just a really friendly guy, and she can see how it looks, but there's nothing there. She apologized if those photos caused me distress and offered to delete them. However, the pictures aren't what hurt me. What hurt me was the fact that she had been involved with the guy while deceiving me, claiming to be working extra hours and spending time with friends. As Lieutenant Com Worf from Star Trek, TNG famously said, vengeance is a dish best served cold. From that night on, Sue was being unusually clingy and attentive to me, like, annoyingly so. She attempted to initiate affection and copulation, but I stonewalled her at every opportunity. Meanwhile, I continued archiving everything she shared with POS. By this point, I had long since gone numb. Any desire I might have had to save my marriage was dead. I had checked out the day I initiated the first phase of my plan. She confided in him that I had become worse, expressing uncertainty and feeling like I hated her, which I do. Then comes the bombshell, she couldn't see him anymore. The guilt was overwhelming, and she felt like karma was suffocating her. She couldn't risk losing me. Despite loving POS deeply, she claimed to be still in love with me, emphasizing the need to save our marriage before losing me. No, my dear, you're about eight months too late for that. POS lost his composure, proclaiming his love for her and insisting she was making a mistake. That text chain would be their last until about three weeks ago. Throughout the remainder of November into December, Sue remained in limbo, trying to gauge my headspace and uncertain if I was actually being unfaithful. Meanwhile, POS bombarded her phone daily, but she didn't respond. I observed her checking her phone often, then quickly putting it away. Meanwhile, phase two of the plan was now officially complete. The divorce papers were done. I found a studio apartment in Co-op City, signed a two-year lease, and all my money was in my personal account. I was ready to throw my haymaker. Now we're at Thanksgiving. My oldest and his girlfriend hosted a small gathering with our immediate families. It was my oldest, his girlfriend, her parents, myself, Sue, and our youngest. We had a great night, and my oldest girlfriend, who's studying to be a chef, did all the cooking herself. As I had to maintain the appearance of nothing being wrong between Sue and me, I initiated affection with her several times that evening. Kisses on the cheek, cute hugs, and wrapping my arms around her shoulders from behind. These gestures didn't go unnoticed by her, and she reveled in them. Keep in mind, this was the first time I touched this woman since I kissed the top of her head the night she confronted me in October, about two months. I won't lie, I felt repulsed doing it, but I had to. I couldn't risk the plan, and being distant in front of my boys, my oldest girlfriend and her parents would raise alarms. So, my youngest decided to stay overnight with his big brother, and Sue and I headed home. On the drive home, she thanked me for being good to her and said, I don't know what you're going through, baby, but I'm here for you. I had to hold off on bursting into maniacal laughter again and responded, I know, I just need time. So for the first time realistically since springtime, we had closeness that night. I thought, why not, with what I'm about to do, might as well get some action before I erase her from my existence. I won't go into detail, but it wasn't lovemaking. When I finished, she was a lump of flesh trying to figure out the direction of the truck that ran her over. No cuddling or anything after. I just got up, showered, and went to sleep in my office. To her confusion, though, I used a contraceptive the first time in two decades. She was definitely perplexed by it, but she didn't ask questions. I sure as hell wasn't going raw with her, knowing that she'd been doing so with POS for months at that point. I woke up the next day and checked my handy-dandy spy app, 
and for the first time in weeks, she responded to P.O.S. The dude went full novella, professing his love for her, claiming she was wasting her time trying to reignite a flame in me that had died. She claimed she had been in a prison with me for 23 years and deserved the love and affection of a man who would cherish her. Keep in mind, this guy is 27 years old, five years older than our oldest son, and he's infatuated with a 45-year-old married mother of two? What a top-notch, high-quality simp. She opted to destroy our marriage and dismantle the home we had built for this guy? A pretty boy with a soft side? Ha! In response, she reiterated essentially the same sentiments from their previous conversation. She loves him, enjoyed their time together, but she can't risk losing me. I'm still the love of her life, but she'll always have a place for him in her heart. They can remain friends if he chooses, but the physical relationship between them is over. He pleaded with her to see him one last time that week, and yes, she agreed. One more for the road, right? Who am I to say anything? That's what I did to her the previous night. I, of course, added all of that to the archive I had compiled. December 4th marked the beginning of Phase 3, the final stage of Operation Shinobi Ghost. The divorce papers were in hand, my new place of residence was set up, and now I had to gradually start moving my stuff out of the house. But first, I had to break the news to my boys. I called my oldest to the house that Friday night, had them join me in my office, and laid everything on the table. Not the specifics, but that their mother had been cheating on me for over a year, and I would be filing for divorce soon. My 17-year-old was especially shaken up because he had recently experienced his first taste of infidelity. His first girlfriend had cheated on him just four months prior. Witnessing his heartbroken a second time, at the idea that his own mother was capable of this, hit him hard. My oldest took it a lot better, and suggested taking his brother to live with him, until this blows over, to which I agreed. We packed up some of his stuff, and he asked me if I was going to be okay. I assured him that I would be alright, and so would he. I promised that we were going to be alright. And then, they were off. The hardest part was now over, and it was time to arm the nukes. Over the next few weeks, day by day, Oz would help me get some of my most sensitive stuff out of the house. I provided him with a list of all the definite items to grab, while Sue and I were at work, and left him the spare key. These were things Sue wouldn't notice were missing, unless you told her, they were gone. I also got a new phone and phone number, informing everyone who needed to know, Oz, Joey, Nina, my boys, Big Sis, and my mother, of my new contact info. Meanwhile, I kept up the ruse with Sue, and she was none the wiser. I trickled bits and pieces of affection to her just to keep her off the trail, while she was still in contact with POS. Not to the extent they were before, but there was still an emotional connection. The fog was faint, but it was still there. All the while I gathered everything and I mean everything. Every bit of data I had archived since I started the plan. Call logs, texts, pics, emails, everything. I began making printouts. I must have spent over $1,500 on Staples supplies, printer ink, paper, binders, the works. I cataloged everything in order, from the beginning of the affair until that last bit two weeks ago, December 16th, in the binders. Fourteen of them. I boxed each one, gift wrapping and addressing them to various recipients. My mother, my father passed away seven years ago, her parents, her two sisters, her brother, her HR department, I forgot to mention POS works for the same company, and there's a rule against intercompany relationships due to the nature of her job. Several friends, POS, and POS's parents. I carried all those packages to the post office and shipped them on December 16th with an estimated delivery between December 22nd and 24th. Perfect. Now we're at Christmas Eve. Sue arrived home around the usual time, unaware if she had seen POS, as I stopped tracking her on the app on the 18th. Assuming I had gathered all the information needed, she showered, spent some time with me, and I concluded the night in the living room. Yes, I know, I'm not the nicest person. The final phase was upon me at last. The nuke I had been arming since June was about to be launched. In the middle of the night, I woke up, wrapped one of the three remaining binders with the divorce papers taped to the inside cover, and left it on my side of the bed with a note that said, Merry Christmas. Next to it, I left my old phone and my lawyer's business card. 
I packed up the rest of my essential items, enough to fill two backpacks, and left my home, where I had spent 23 years for the last time. That, my friends, was one week ago. To Sue, I am completely off the grid, gone, shadow ghosted. She's blocked on FB, but for some reason, she hasn't blocked me, so I'm keeping tabs on the fallout. It's absolutely glorious. My packages have reached everyone I sent them to, and Sue is facing severe backlash. Her youngest sister completely reprimanded her. Both of her parents condemned her. My mom tore into her mercilessly. I know my mom has a mean streak, but the things she called Sue were unfathomable. Sue is desperately trying to find out if anyone knows where I am, but those who do aren't saying a word. On her FB feed, she's desperately trying to reach me, likely knowing I'm likely looking but I'm not saying a word to her without my lawyer present. That'll be the next time I share oxygen with her. She has no way of spinning the narrative to paint me as the bad guy because I've exposed her to everyone who matters to her. According to a mutual friend working in the same company as her, she and POS are apparently being put on administrative leave as of tomorrow. So yeah, chances are she'll be going into 2021 unemployed. As for the final two binders, one has been turned over to my lawyer as my final piece of evidence for my impending divorce, and the last one I placed in my storage unit to be burned in Joey's fire pit when the divorce is final. Do I feel guilty about this? No. Not even in the slightest. For 23 years I did right by this woman. I gave her the home she wanted, the family she wanted, the life I felt we both deserved, and I loved her unconditionally. Never did I falter. Never did I stray. Never did I even entertain the notion of breaking my vows. When an issue came up that I felt was affecting our marriage, I came to her and told her, and we sorted it out as best we could. Instead of coming to me and expressing her unhappiness with our bed life at the time, she decided to seek comfort in another man's bed. So no, I have no sympathy for what I did or for her. She can burn in hell for all I care. The most I stand to lose is my house, a car, and maybe a couple of hundred bucks a month in alimony. Still, considering the divorce is filed under the statute of infidelity and NYS is at fault, that might get waived with the insurmountable amount of evidence I've provided. As far as I'm concerned, she's dead to me, and I'm never looking back. Initially, after discovering her infidelity, I pondered how to salvage the situation. However, witnessing the audacity of their interactions and subsequent communications fueled my anger. What started as regret and sadness quickly transformed into fury. When I confided in my friend Oz, I had already decided to take a scorched earth approach. Unexpectedly, I continued this approach longer than I anticipated. I could have confronted her four to five months before Christmas, but I confess that I derived pleasure from making her suffer. It turned into a game, and the prize was watching her squirm. While this may make me seem somewhat sadistic, she destroyed our marriage, and I was determined to dismantle her relationships with everyone we know. Despite not being inherently evil or vindictive, I firmly believe in treating others fairly and adhering to the golden rule. However, I cannot tolerate disrespect. My STBXW is a fragile, superficial, self-entitled individual who prioritized her desires over our marriage. She will receive no forgiveness or mercy from me. The upcoming months will be challenging as my divorce unfolds, marked by hurtful words and spiteful actions. Nevertheless, I will remain steadfast in my mission to ruin her, offering no pity or leniency, just as she showed me none when she broke her vows. This battle is far from over, but my determination surpasses hers. I am determined to break her and leave her with nothing, feeling no remorse in doing so. Update. Christmas Day marked the first full day I spent in my new apartment, a work in progress where I plan to reside for at least two years. Although I still need to acquire more items, I have overall transformed it into my home. My sons, along with the eldest girlfriend, spent a significant part of the day with me. The girlfriend brought treats and prepared a delightful meal. It provided an opportunity to engage in meaningful conversations with my sons, a connection I hadn't experienced in a long time. My older sister also visited, bringing more goodies and spending time with us, marking the first time she had seen her nephews in nearly a year. Their presence had a positive impact on me. Otherwise, I might have resorted to excessive drinking if alone. Everyone left around eight-ish, prompting me to decide to hang out with Joey and his wife Claudia. We spent a couple of hours together, had a couple of drinks, and then I returned home. The next significant development occurred on December 29th, 
2020. Around midday, I received a text from Nina, asking if I was busy that night. Since I wasn't, we agreed to meet after I finished work. We went to a nearby diner for indoor dining at 25% capacity. Nina openly shared her feelings, confessing that she has liked me since our teenage years, but never had the chance to express it due to Sue entering the picture. I've known Nina longer than Sue by two years, and she has been a part of my social circle with Oz and Joey. In high school, we were the social outcasts, the raver kids who didn't fit into conventional cliques. Back then, Nina faced challenges with weight and diabetes, but we always had chemistry. Nowadays, Nina is a personal trainer and yoga instructor, having transformed into a beautiful swan. In short, we decided that upon the finalization of my divorce, we will start seeing each other. Yes, we slept together that night, and I feel no shame. Nina has been a better friend to me than Sue ever was. That's not to say Sue wasn't my best friend, but over the near quarter century I've known Nina, she has consistently supported me, even stepping back from her own feelings to allow me to pursue a life with Sue. This selflessness resonated with me in ways I didn't anticipate. Despite sounding like I'm justifying the decision in my head, to me, it was the right choice, and I plan on exploring what the future holds with Nina with total commitment. Now, on to yesterday, the day I met my wife and her lawyer to discuss the divorce. It has been two weeks since I ceased communication with my soon-to-be ex-wife, STBXW. This Monday, I received a call from my lawyer informing me that Sue's attorney scheduled a meeting to discuss divorce terms on January 6, 21, yesterday. I met with him on Tuesday to outline my desired terms, an uncontested divorce, citing marital neglect from Sue. In summary, I propose a complete division of assets, selling my half of the house to her and keeping our respective vehicles. I retain ownership of my cabin in the Poconos, and under the grounds of marital neglect, she will not receive spousal support from me. Regarding my son, whom I'll refer to as 17, he is free to choose his residence post-divorce, likely with me. On Wednesday, I dressed in my Johnny Cash best and attended a meeting at my lawyer's office with my wife and her lawyer. She appeared disheveled and barely held it together. Without delving into legal jargon, her lawyer presented terms for reconciliation, which I promptly rejected. We agreed to a legal separation leading to an uncontested divorce. The only revision is that I will provide $653 per month in temporary spousal support to cover utilities until she gains employment. She got fired for inappropriate behavior. This support will last up to a year post-finalization. Financially, it won't significantly impact me even if she takes time finding a new job. After a full calendar year post-divorce finalization, she is on her own. It's a small price to pay for freedom. If all goes smoothly, I'll be free of her by early April, approximately three months from now. Post-meeting, my lawyer provided final words and promised to keep me updated on the filing progress. Outside, Sue approached me, asking if we could talk. I agreed. While she held it together during the meeting, she broke down outside, expressing remorse and stating she never intended for things to go as far as they did. She admitted to falling in love with someone else, but acknowledged the wrongdoing in betraying her husband. She asked for forgiveness and proposed the idea of starting anew in a few years. I informed her that this would be our last conversation. I reminded her that our son is almost an adult, capable of making his own choices. I conveyed that I had given half of my life and unconditional love, only for her to confess love to someone else. I expressed the impossibility of forgiving her, stating that I loved who she once was, but despised who stood before me. I made it clear that seeing her again would be too soon. Here we are on the sidewalk in Midtown Manhattan, with her causing a scene, crying her eyes out. A couple of people walk by, giving side glances. But at that point, I didn't care. I wasn't about to publicly offend her. I had already socially and professionally destroyed her. However, I needed to release the last bit of emotion I had for her. I finished by telling her that I didn't regret the 23 years I spent as her husband. My regret was that, in those 23 years, she chose the easy way out, and I thought she was mine when, in reality, it was just my turn. Putting in my Raycons, I turned around and walked away. Later that night, her father called and apologized. He commended me for always being a good man to his daughter 
and expressed his disappointment in her actions. I'll miss the old man. He's been my default father figure since my dad passed away years ago. However, I can't see myself maintaining a relationship with anyone on her side of the family. After that call, I went on Facebook and symbolically changed my relationship status to divorced. It's not final yet, but in my eyes, it's over. When I make a post on Facebook, it's an event. So plenty of people started reaching out over Messenger, asking questions. I laid it all out, stating that I filed for divorce with Sue earlier in the day. Nina called, shocked at how fast I pulled the trigger. I asked her to come over, and she did. We spent the night together, talking into the wee hours of the morning. I haven't felt this level of relief and connection in a really long time. Nina gets me, and I can't get enough of being around her. Since the day she confided in me, she's all that's been on my mind. Some might say it's messed up that I'm moving on so fast, but as far as I'm concerned, my marriage ended the day POS let Sue touch him, so I'm about due. So, that's it. My divorce is in the works, and I'm moving on to start a relationship with Nina. We'll take it slow, and we won't announce anything until the divorce with Sue is legal and official. As for Sue, I couldn't care less about what happens to her. She could move in with POS into our old home for all I care. I'll be getting my money for the house over 2021, four quarterly installments, and apart from the dollar $653 i will pay her monthly, I never have to see or speak to her again. Since only my closest friends, two sons, older sister and mother, have my new contact info, and I've completely blocked my soon-to-be ex-wife, STBX on all social outlets, she has had no means of reaching me since I left her on Christmas Eve. Still, some of our mutual friends do. Last night, I'm in my apartment, and I receive a voice call notification on Messenger from one of these friends, one of the few who hadn't abandoned her following my outing of her affair. She didn't waste any time when I answered, saying she had checked on Sue, the STBXW, and found her passed out in the bedroom, foaming at the mouth with two bottles of empty pills next to her. She's in the ICU in critical but stable condition. The doctor said she will likely pull through, but she won't be well after. She begged and pleaded for me to come. Her parents and two of her sisters were also at the hospital. My guess is they were notified after the hospital attempted to reach me, but Sue would still have my old number as her emergency contact. I simply told her no. Sue's not my problem anymore, and she decided to take the easy way out rather than deal with the shame and agony of the 23-year marriage she blew up. I then told her friend that if Sue's family was there, they could help her sort out the pieces. But as far as Sue and I are concerned, there is no Sue and I anymore. I then ended the call. I've had a few hours to reflect on it, and my sons called me this morning to ask if I knew. I affirmed that I did, but also made it clear to both of them that if they want to be there and supportive of their mother, I won't hold it against them or judge them. After all, she is their mother. However, I personally wash my hands of her and care little to nothing about what she does to or for herself anymore. They were taken aback by this, but they respected my stance. Now that the news has broken about her self-destruction attempt, many friends who had distanced themselves from her are resurfacing, urging me to support her in her time of need, despite what she did to me. I've been informed that her affair partner tried to visit her this morning, but wasn't allowed, because he's not family. I'm being pressured to go see her, but I feel nothing for this woman anymore. I haven't for a very long time. I checked out during the process of getting my payback for her betrayal, and I stand by the fact that I don't care at all for what she's done. In fact, it makes me hate her even more. She's the one who was unfaithful, who thought a near-year-long fling with a guy five years older than her oldest son was worth destroying 23 years. Even now, facing the consequences of her choices, she chooses the most selfish way of dealing with it. Now that she's likely to survive, she's garnered immediate sympathy from everyone who took her to task, and I'm being portrayed as the jaded ex-husband unwilling to sympathize by most of her family. Except her dad who reached out and said he respects my decision to stay away. It's like I never truly knew this woman in 23 years, and it has come to this. I understand that the way I broke things off may have put her in a poor mental state, but a whole new set of issues has arisen. Either she had a complete breakdown and decided to damage herself, 
or she made a risky, calculated move to gain favor back from those who condemned her weeks ago for betraying me. I want to be perfectly clear. I am not going to visit Sue. She waved her right to my care when she let her lover put himself inside her. I may come off as heartless, but despite my calm demeanor, my feelings are still very raw. I don't care about this woman and haven't for a long time. If you were in my shoes, you'd see her actions differently, maybe tormenting her for months, fooling her into thinking I was cheating on her while she cheated on me, and destroying her socially and professionally led to her meltdown. Maybe I am a heartless sociopath, but as Arthur Fleck said, you get what you deserve. I gave this woman half of my life and did everything to be the best husband she could ever have. By her own admission, I had no bearing on her decision to betray our marriage. She did it for her, and her selfishness knows no bounds. I'm glad to be rid of her. If it makes me the bad guy because I won't see her and never plan on interacting with her again, so be it. I hold true to my convictions. She made the choice to betray me, to put her needs above the needs of our marriage, so now it's my turn to choose me over everything else. She can rot in the darkest pit of hell for all I care. Let everyone else help her fix herself. My obligation to care about her well-being ended the day we signed the separation agreement. I just needed to get this off my chest. If you're going to cast judgment on me for feeling this way, save it. After 23 years and two children, I never really knew this woman, and I have no sympathy for her, nor will I ever. Let her rot. I've been informed by Sue's dad that she's been moved from the ICU to the mental health wing. Doctors are still monitoring her mental state. She's conscious and cognitive again, but obviously lethargic. Her father told me she asked if I came to see her, and he said no, after which she shut down. He respectfully said any further news he'll share only if I inquire, understanding the headspace I'm in. Also, I've scheduled counseling for 17, with the first consultation this coming Monday. Today, against everything I previously stated, I decided to visit Sue. She's been out of the hospital for four days now, and surprisingly, it was Nina who convinced me that seeing her in her weakened state might help me let go of the contempt I feel for her. Around 6 p.m., I called her for the first time since I served her. Her hello lacked the brightness I'd known for over two decades. Her voice was hoarse and weak. The moment she heard my voice, she began crying, taking almost three minutes to regain composure enough to talk again. Before she could say anything, I informed her that I was coming to see her by 8 p.m., and she agreed. It's about an hour and a half from Co-op City, where my new apartment is, to my old home. I grabbed a bite to eat from the local pizzeria and started on my way there. I arrived around 7.47 p.m., and she was already at the door before I pulled into the driveway. As I approached, I could see the toll her actions had taken on her, noticeably thinner, an unhealthy kind of thin. As a whole, she looked like the walking dead. The first thing she tried was to come in for a hug, and I stopped her cold. She got the hint that I wasn't there to console her and backed off immediately. We went inside and sat in the living room. Almost immediately, Sue told me she wanted to come clean, about everything. She explained that she couldn't live with the guilt of what she did to me and the boys. Since the day we signed the separation agreement, she went into a downward spiral of guilt and agony that led to her self-destruction attempt. Her friend, the one who called me from the hospital, had noticed her behavior and started coming over to check on her. She said the doctors told her that if she hadn't been found just an hour earlier, she would have succeeded. Sue admitted to failing me as a wife. Falling for POS was wrong, as was her choice not to pull back when she knew she was getting too deep. She also apologized for sharing many lovemaking details of our marriage and speaking ill of me to him. She never imagined herself being capable of doing that, but she was. She believed in her head that she was doing the right thing, but when she thought I was cheating, it hit her like a ton of bricks. The feeling of betrayal was suffocating, and she had to get out as soon as possible, but it was obviously too late by then. She then asked me at what point did I stop caring, to which I replied that the night she confronted me with the notion of me cheating, with the knowledge that she had been with POS for months at that point, I lost all respect for her, and it solidified my resolve to enact my plan. She told me that when she woke up on Christmas morning and found the gift I left, she was over the moon until she opened it. When she realized what it was and how much I had known, she literally went mad and hasn't set foot in our bedroom since. She was frantically trying to find out if anyone knew where I was, 
but when she went on Facebook to ask, she started getting thrashed by friends and family about what she had done, with no idea how everyone knew so fast. That's when I told her about the other binders. The look of shock on her face was priceless. It all dawned on her that I did this to her. Everything she's gone through, her friends turning on her, her family shaming her, and even her losing her job, was my doing. She fell silent and shut down after that. I took the time to use the bathroom, and it was in shambles. The mirror was broken, her skincare products were scattered, and the tub looked like it hadn't been cleaned since they took her to the hospital. When I came back to the living room, she had her face in her hands, weeping, and I can honestly say, I felt nothing. No more anger, no more rage, and absolutely not a shred of pity. They say the opposite of love is indifference. Looking at her, that's all I felt. She gazes up at me, uttering, I messed everything up, I ruined us, and I have no idea what to do, I can't do this by myself. I remind her she has her family, the friend who found her, and our sons, but not me. She never will, ever again. I explain that I came to offer closure from the ordeal she just put herself through, but the moment I exit that door, I won't be looking back. The topic of POS arises shortly after. She discloses that he contacted her two days ago. They talked for a couple of hours, and it concluded with her advising him to move on with his life, find someone younger, and forget she exists. The rest of the conversation involves Sue apologizing for betraying me and questioning if this is truly the end. I look her directly in the eyes without hesitation and affirm that yes, it's been over long before I served the divorce notice on Christmas. Sensing it was time to leave, no more words were exchanged. I departed, leaving her on the couch. I closed the door behind me, got into my car, and drove home. I needed to express this while it's fresh in my head. The saga of Sue is over. Seventeen and I are both scheduled for counseling in the coming weeks. Nina and I are still going strong, adhering to the plan of keeping things under wraps until my divorce is final. I'm staying active, motivated, and looking forward to a future with a woman I know will cherish and honor me, as she has done from the shadows for decades. It's time for me to focus on the life ahead of me. Update. Anyway, it's been just over two months since I served my wife divorce papers, and it's been a month since my last update. Many people have expressed concern about Seventeen, my youngest son. Just days after my last update, he began individual counseling, I see. I accompanied him for his first two sessions, and he has been going on his own for every session since. He attends twice a week, and it has significantly helped. Overall, he's doing fine, but I can see that his trust in relationships has been completely shattered. The lasting effects of his own experience with infidelity, coupled with dealing with his mother's actions of cheating and her attempted ending, have left a significant scar that I believe may take decades to heal. I discovered that his experience was even worse than he let on. He actually caught his ex-girlfriend making out with a guy he thought was a friend, but it turned out the guy was only getting close to him to get to her. He never told me this aspect of his breakup. My heart breaks for my son to have had to experience this at such a pivotal point in his formative years. You do all you can to protect your children, but then life goes ahead and says no. He has decided to stick to IC for the long term, and I have assured him, that he can talk to me about anything, without any boundaries. Next up is my individual counseling, I see. If you've listened most of my entries, you know I have a bit of an anger problem. It's strange because I've always been a reserved, controlled, and stoic man. However, this whole experience evidently awakened a sleeping dragon in me that's a pure fire breather. I've discussed everything with my therapist, and when I say everything, I mean everything. When I explained the extent of what I did to my ex, he was both impressed and appalled, which wasn't the reaction I was expecting. Apparently, I display sociopathic tendencies when provoked, which doesn't surprise me, given everything I did. My sessions are not so much dramatic, they're more organizational, unpacking all of the things going on in my head regarding the implosion of my marriage and trying to find balance. Now for the elephant in the room, Nina, I have no idea where I'd be without this woman. I never expected to have such a caring, empathetic, nurturing woman by my side to carry me through all of this. We are still going strong, and despite our attempts to keep our ongoing relationship under wraps, it's pretty much out in our group. She just gets me. She always has since we were teens, 
and since she knows the pain of having the person you've invested your life in to cheat on you as well, she does all she can to help me cope with my feelings. We split time between staying at her place and my own. The discussion has come up about moving in with each other, but her five-year-old puts a kibosh on that idea. My place isn't big enough for three people, and I'm locked into my lease until 2022, so for now, we'll keep splitting time between. When her daughter is away with her father, Nina's at my place. When she has her daughter, I'm at hers. Speaking of her daughter, I absolutely adore her, and she's taken a shine to me. I wish I could find the words to truly put into perspective how important Nina has been to me through all of this. If you haven't taken the time to listen my previous entries, Nina has secretly been in love with me since we were sophomores in high school. But she was an ugly duckling back then who thought she had no chance with me. She actively sat by and watched me chase after date and marry my soon-to-be ex-wife Sue, knowing how she felt. For well over 25 years, she held this secret until a week after I had my divorce hearing, where we met for food, and she laid everything on the table. I consider myself lucky to have her in my life. We constantly talk about what the future holds between us. As we've both been burned by marriage, we're definitely not going that route, but we have discussed a civil union. We'll probably wait a little while before going that route, but it's pretty much decided between the two of us that we are it for each other. Last but not least, the soon-to-be ex-wife, Sue. What I want to share with everyone about her is, well, there's nothing to share. Since the final time I spoke to her after her attempted ending, I've implemented a 100% no-contact policy. I have no knowledge of her current situation or activities, and I have no desire to find out. In my perspective, she's no longer a part of my life. That pretty much covers it. Life moves forward. It's March 2nd as I type this, so there's only one more month until the completion of the filing process. By this time next month, I'll officially be a free man, and I'm eagerly counting down the days until I can genuinely embark on the next chapter of my life. To clarify a point, I made an error in my statement regarding being clinically diagnosed as a sociopath. I assumed that because my therapist mentioned I display sociopathic tendencies when provoked, it was a clinical diagnosis. It wasn't. It was simply his professional observation. Additionally, my oldest son, who is 22, doesn't genuinely intend to cause damage to POS. His remarks were made in the heat of anger. Update. On April 13th, just one month ago, Sue officially became my ex-wife. Initially, my lawyer informed me that it would be finalized on the 18th, but due in part to the reopening of things in NYC with the decrease in COVID cases, it was pushed through a few days earlier. Jeff, my lawyer, called me on April 12th and requested that I visit him the following day. When I did, he handed me the finalization notice and shook my hand. I couldn't just leave it at that, so I went in and gave him a hug expressing gratitude for all he'd done for me. On my way home, all I could do was replay mental movies of everything, the last 24 years of my life, memories, and history. When I stepped into my apartment, it finally happened. I fall on the floor, and all the compressed emotion came pouring out. I haven't cried like that in ages, but it wasn't a sad cry. Not by any means. My soul felt liberated after being held in the deepest, darkest abyss. That night, I made a phone call to my 22. I kept it short, saying that it's finalized, and his mother and I are no longer married as of that day. He asked how I felt. I'm sure he could tell in my voice I'd been crying, and I told him I was fine. Next, 17 got on the phone, and we spoke for nearly 90 minutes. 22 and his fiance have been looking after him well, and he, like myself, is still going to therapy. I won't go into detail about our conversation, but I will say there's still a lot of work to be done, especially regarding his view of relationships. Later that night, Nina came to see me, as she always does, and I shared the news. She wrapped her arms around my waist and held tight as, yes, I cried again. Once I composed myself, Nina assured me that no matter what, she would never betray me and loves me with all her heart. Every word of it is true. While I don't regret the life I built with Sue and appreciate the two strong sons she gave me, it's clear to me now that I picked the wrong woman. In the last four and a half months, Nina has given so much without asking for anything in return. All she asks is for me to be there for her. I won't dwell on her for too long, but she truly is my hero.
Following the divorce finalization, some other interesting events occurred. Notably, POS reached out to me. Yes, he actually sent me a message. I believe he's suffered enough. His first action was to apologize for his role in all of this. He explained the consequences of the binder I sent to his mother. Essentially, he's been excommunicated from his family. His devout Catholic mother, who attends church three days a week, was enraged to learn that her son had broken up a marriage that lasted almost a quarter century. She kicked him out that very day, and within a week, his employer, after receiving the binder, fired him as well. He's been couch hopping and searching for a new job ever since. He mentioned that he wanted to reach out to me on social media, you know, all the places he blocked me when avoiding Sue. But he admitted he was afraid because, in his words, if I was able to find him before, I could find him again. I confess I could have gone all in on destroying this guy, but I refrained. I inquired about the last time he saw Sue, and he admitted it had been months. The last time he spoke to her, Sue advised him to forget about her and move on with his life, consistent with what Sue told me. I asked a few more questions, and surprisingly, the guy was forthcoming, perhaps seeking penance for the chaos he caused. Much of what he said aligned with information from the text documentation I gathered. I didn't respond much, I asked, and he answered. The conversation lasted about 20 minutes before he reiterated his apology. That's when I delivered this message. You're a 27-year-old man who has to live the rest of your life knowing that your own mother now loathes you for breaking up a marriage almost as long as you've been breathing. I know you've messaged me because karma is eating at you, but I won't give you closure. When I was 27, I was building a legacy. Right now, you're a homeless, jobless homewrecker. If you're smart, you'll learn from this lesson. If not, you'll stay a duck up until you're my age, assuming you make it that far. I'd wish you luck, but you don't need luck. You need to get your crap in order. With that, I ended the conversation and blocked him. It may not be the closure he sought, and I could have been more hostile, but I believe those words will haunt him enough. The next significant event is that as of May 4, 2021, Nina is now my wife. Over the last two months, we've had lengthy discussions about our future. Nina made it clear that she has no intentions of being with anyone else and desires to be my wife, urging me to adopt her daughter, Anna, as my own. Anna, who just turned six, idolizes me, and I'm the first father figure she's had since her biological father left when she was four. Nina has been cautious about introducing any man into Anna's life unless they had staying power, and I, with experience raising children, fit the bill. Anna and my 17 have developed a close bond, resembling a big brother and little sister dynamic, which my therapist views as a positive sign. Despite 17's shattered innocence, he sees innocence in Anna that he wants to protect. So, we decided last Monday to go to City Hall and get married. It took 24 hours to get the marriage license, and the reveal was the most uneventful ever. Oz mentioned, as if no one didn't see this coming, and Big Sis said, now placing bets on when the now expecting post goes up. We thought we were keeping our relationship under wraps, but apparently, everyone had figured it out already. This woman has professed her undying, unconditional love for me, laying in my arms and expressing happiness. She shared her feelings about me over the past 25 years, even during her marriage to Sue. She lamented that Sue won and admitted to occasional thoughts of having an affair with me. Despite that, throughout all the years I've known her, she has given me so much and asked so little in return. Even the woman I married and had two children with has never shown the amount of love to me that Nina has. It would be foolish not to give her my name. So now, she has it, and we're in the early stages of paperwork for me adopting Anna. And lastly, there's Sue. I haven't communicated with her since my last visit to our marital home, nearly four months ago. However, mutual friends, the few that remain, occasionally provide me with updates. Through one of those friends, a realtor, I learned that she sold the house, and he offered her a position as a clerical assistant in his firm, waiving the assisted payments I had to make due to her unemployment. She now resides in a small apartment close to his office, which he also helped arrange. She's functional, but a mere semblance of her former self. Her weight gain has been minimal, and she keeps to herself, focusing on her work and avoiding socializing with anyone but him likely due to the origins of the issue beginning with her socializing with co-workers. The last update I received about her 
was at the end of March, where I expressed gratitude to him for looking out for her, but made it clear I no longer needed updates. She's no longer my concern. As 17 approaches legal adulthood in a year, I have no reason to engage with her again, and I won't. And that concludes my journey of betrayal, revenge, attempted ending, and mental agony. After this, I'm retreating back into the swamp to live with my new frog wife and her little tadpole. December 24th marked the two-year anniversary of the night I served divorce papers to my ex and left her for good. Much has transpired since then, and as I reflect on where my life was compared to where I am now, it amazes me that I'm still standing. A lesser man might have crumbled under the weight of all I experienced. Two crucial factors compelled me to persevere. Firstly, my youngest son needed me to set an example of standing up for oneself and not allowing a partner to walk all over you or control the narrative. At the time of D-Day, he had experienced being cheated on by his first girlfriend. The idea of his own mother doing the same to me, akin to what his ex-girlfriend did to him, significantly affected him. Secondly, there's my now girlfriend Nina, whom I've known for 25 years. She had been in my life before my ex, Sue. Over the course of everything, I discovered that Nina had harbored feelings for me since our teenage years, but never mustered the courage to confess. When Sue entered the picture, Nina stepped back and let me go. However, she has loved me from the shadows ever since. Witnessing my struggles, she felt it was time to reveal her feelings, and we've been together ever since. Life has moved forward. Nina and I are now living together in a civil union, enjoying all the benefits of marriage without the associated headaches. In the unlikely event we decide to part ways, we simply break the contract and go our separate ways with what we brought to the union. No lawyers, no messy paperwork. I doubt that day will come. Nina was previously married with a now six-year-old daughter. We both agreed from the start never to marry again, leading us to pursue the civil union route. My sons and her daughter are inseparable when together. My boys revealed their desire for a little sister, and she has seamlessly filled that role. The relationship between her and 18 has blossomed into the classic big brother-little sister dynamic which brings me immense joy. There was a point where I feared 18 would shut himself off completely, but thanks to therapy and our discussions, he has come full circle. He remains a bit shy around girls his age, and I'm not pressuring him. He'll get back on track when he's ready. 23 and his fiance are now officially married as of August this year. The wedding was remarkable, mostly funded by her parents. Despite my insistence on contributing, her father, with whom I've developed a good friendship, was well aware of the divorce circumstances and assured me that he and his wife would cover all expenses. Sue, my ex-wife, attended the wedding. 23 is on better terms with his mother than 18, who hasn't communicated with her since the upheaval began. It's his choice, and I won't force him to maintain a relationship or communication until he's ready. Seating arrangements were made to avoid us laying eyes on each other, though I did catch a glimpse of her, or what's left of her. The woman I saw wasn't the one I married. She looked frail and weak. The divorce evidently took a hefty toll on her. In my heart, I wanted to feel pity, but there was absolutely nothing there. Nina, at one point, grabbed my arm tightly and asked if I was okay. I assured her I was fine and that today was about my son becoming a husband, nothing more. Continuing from that, I received perhaps the best news when we went to 23 and his wife's place for Thanksgiving. She's a chef and lives for big events. I'm going to be a grandpa. His wife was one and a half months pregnant at the time. After dinner, I shared a congratulatory cigar with my son, and we had an extensive man-to-man -man talk, the first since it all started. He confided in me that he was nervous, mentioning that he wouldn't know what to do if something similar happened to him. I advised him that you can't force anyone to be loyal, emphasizing that you only control yourself and how you handle such situations. It's how you handle it that defines you. Soft times make you happy, hard times make you aware. I don't think he has anything to worry about, his wife admires him, and she has been by his side through it all. I cherish her for keeping my son focused and on track, as a good woman should for her man. The gender reveal is next month, and I secretly hope it's a girl. On the home front, Nina and I are in the early stages of discussing the possibility of me adopting her little girl and her taking my name. Although she currently has her father's last name, he has been out of the picture since she was one, 
making zero attempts to make contact. We don't even know if he's still alive, and he's definitely not in the U.S. anymore. Nina was born here, but is of Albanian descent. Her ex was born in Albania and had dual citizenship. He's likely back in Albania and we'll never see him again. Nothing is definite, but Nina has made it clear she doesn't want her daughter to carry her ex's name, and that's it. I've been living my life one day at a time, working hard, and spending time with the love of my life and her darling daughter. Life goes on. To all of you in the darkness, questioning if it ever ends and if you will heal from betrayal, the answer is yes. Commit yourself to not letting the darkness consume you. You mean too much to too many people to let that happen. Reach out to those who love and care for you. Walking the path of recovering from infidelity alone is a fool's errand. No good comes of it. Put your faith in those who will support you. As for your cheating partner, expose the truth once you have it. Find proof, protect your heart and assets, plan your exit strategy, and make the truth known. Never let them control the narrative, except gaslighting or succumb to blame shifting. Trust your instincts. If your gut says something is wrong, find out the truth. Never ignore the red flags. When wearing rose-colored glasses, they're impossible to see.